Okay, let's get started. What is happening on Friday? Test. Test. Woo! Anyone excited for it other than me? <laughs> Perfect. So, um, so here's the test without the questions, just so you can get a feel for it. Um, uh, it's certainly going to be easier than midterm two. I can almost guarantee that. But of course, difficulty is subjective. This it may be harder for you, but I think overall it is easier. So, uh, same structure, exactly the same structure as last time. Uh, so, 10 multiple choice questions across two pages, uh, nothing new there. Then, uh, question two is two programming subparts, I guess. Uh, one of them is uh, programming something to do with vector. And then the second one is you're given a choice of which one you want to do. You just do one of them. And then that's it for the second part. So, uh, these will be more along the difficulty of the labs. So in terms of like length and difficulty, they're not hard, but it's not something we've seen before either. So it's just a mild change over something that we've seen before, like uh, a problem that we think we could solve in principle, but we actually explicitly have not done yet. That's the type of thing that will be here. Any questions on question two? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is just so that it's easier for you and me. Only do one of the two. Don't do both because, uh, for one, I have to grade more, and two, uh, it's worse for you because the lower score of the two will be the one that's given. So just do one of them, and then you're all set. Okay? Other questions about question two? Yeah. Guys, shh, I can't hear you. Uh, well, the thing says it's something to do with programming and vectors, so I think that's a good idea. So something with that has something to do with arrays and vectors in general, but it's going to be working with vectors here. But arrays and vectors are effectively the same thing for what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. Same as always. Yes. Uh, other questions about question two? So uh, question two has a backside for extra space if you want it or if you need it. Uh, question three, this one's going to be interesting. So uh, my, th my friend thinks the world is not just black and white. So hopefully that'll give you some hints about what I'm going to be asking there. Um, uh, I like including questions with my friend, this vague person who doesn't actually exist. But uh, I do have friends, but this person is... Uh, not real. Um, so the first question is something to do with searching and you'll be programming it directly. So I, we talked about what two search algorithms so far? Binary and linear search. So do you think I'm going to ask you implement binary search? No. no, because that's not helpful to solve a problem that you haven't seen before. But this problem will be asking you to, to program some search algorithm that's a mild change from the ones we've seen. Using your knowledge of how they work, can you implement this one? Okay? And then, uh, so these, uh, the next bits are a change from what we've done before on tests. So this one is uh, something about justification. So it's like, uh, you'll be justifying some statement about this search algorithm, okay? So uh, I ask you this about this search algorithm, justify why it is true or why the statement is false. Or justify this related to this other thing that we've uh, studied and maybe compare and contrast, that sort of thing. Okay, so that's the first half of the question. The second half is, um, I'm going to give some qualification about a list of numbers. So I give you some list of numbers, and it has some property if such a thing is satisfied about the numbers. So, for example, 
a list of numbers is in sorted order if x0 is less than or equal to x1, less than or equal to x2, all the way through xn. So that would be a property of the numbers, but I'm not going to ask you sorted order here. I'm going to say a list of numbers is whatever if something about the numbers is satisfied. Then I'm going to ask you, write an algorithm in English, not in C++, just uh, write uh, an algorithm in English for some type of search algorithm related to these numbers. Okay, so uh, a list of numbers, for example, uh, is in sorted order if that condition I said, and then I ask you to implement some search algorithm in English to solve uh, this problem, to be given some value and then find uh, that value within this list of numbers or something like that, yeah. Yeah, good question. So what I'll be, so for example, for linear search, uh, an algorithm in English would be loop through the list of numbers and if the observed value is ever equal to the uh, value we are searching for, then stop and return true, otherwise return false. That would be an example of an algorithm in English. So it's basically just saying what you would write in C++, but in English, to make it human readable and understandable. Yeah, good question. Um, so this one, uh, it seems like, okay, it's the same question as this one but I assure you it's not the same question. And for this one, because it's bonus, you'll have to think a little harder about that one. And then related to this bonus one, I have another bonus about explain why something is always true or something is always not true. Okay, but, there are, but this entire question is about search algorithms. Okay, so it's related to linear and binary search. Other questions, any questions about question three? And yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Other questions. Okay. And then, uh, of course, there's a back for question three. And by popular demand, we have an entire whole extra sheet, front and back, for extra work if you need it. I don't think you will need it, but if it's there for people who either write big or write a lot, it's there for you. Okay. Any other questions about the test or anything? Okay, um, one, uh, one uh, thing is uh, I had one student email me and ask me, uh, can you have extra office hours for uh, assignment six because I can't go to your office hours or any of the TA's office hours. So Merry Christmas in late October, I have uh, an extra set of office hours on Friday after the test. You may not want to see me after the test, but uh, if, you, uh, if you happen to need help on assignment six, uh, just come to my office and then we can sort things out. Yeah, other questions, yeah. What are the, what? Times of the uh, office hours? Uh, directly after class, 9.30 to 11.30, but they're on the announcements page. Yeah, but 9.30 to 11.30. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I would assume that you have looked at it because it's been out uh, like a week at least. So I would assume that you have some, I, either at least some ideas of how to ap approach it. Um, what I would say is, I, instead of saying, I have no idea how to solve this, I don't think that's going to be very helpful because one, I can't diagnose what's actually, uh, what you're struggling with, and two, it shows that you're not actually taking the assignment seriously. So at least have some ideas of how to solve it, even if you haven't written any code yet. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the question was, how to populate a 2D vector? Uh, here it is. Uh, let's see. Um, here's an example. So it's just a quick example. 
So uh, what's actually happening here? Oops. So I have a 2D vector here. And then let's, uh, so this is not uh, making the, mm, OK, actually, let's do it this way. Uh, yes. Uh, vec of, uh, I don't need in place back here. Um, uh, std vector. I think this will be OK. Yeah. So uh, this is just an example. You don't have to populate a vector this way. Um, and in fact, for your lab nine, you don't have to do this that way, this way at all. But it's just an example. So here I make a 2D vector. How, uh, how many rows are in this vector right here when I declare it? Zero. How many? Uh, so there's zero elements in there. And then therefore, there are no columns for the same reason. So here, what I'm going to do is, uh, actually, I'm going to change this to 10. Mm, yeah, I'm going to change these to 10. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to loop this uh, for loop how many times? Uh, 10 times, because I have row idx is 0, uh, less than 10, plus 1 every time. So here, what I'm going to do is, uh, in this vector, this 2D vector, I'm going to put one, one more row with how many elements so far right here. I'm going to push back some vector, but how many elements is this one vector I'm pushing back? Zero. So if we look here, I don't put here any uh, number of uh, elements that I want in here. So in fact, this is zero elements so far. Uh, I can do two curly braces, too. Yeah, they're equivalent. But it's just one is declaring it uh, right where the declaration occurs, and this one is occurring at some later point. But uh, the end result's the same. So in fact, uh, but let's just try to understand this first before I show you the better way. So here what I'm doing is I'm pushing at the very end of this 2D vector. So this brand new vector is at the very end of the the 2D vector. What I'm doing here in this inner for loop is saying, I'm going to loop this thing 10 times, and then vec of row idx, which element of the 2D vector is that? Well, let's see. The first time around, what is row idx? The first time is 0. So when I push back this empty vector in here, what is the last index of this 2D vector? I pushed one thing back, so what is it at index? Zero. So when I look up vec of row idx, what was row idx? Zero. So this is looking up the very last element, the thing I just pushed into the vector. So this end vector right here, now it says push back something in that vector. OK? So what's happening here is uh, at index zero, I'm going to be pushing back the 0, then 1, then uh, actually, that's not true. So the first time around, the first vector is going to have 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. So once we push back 9, the last time this inner for loop goes, what is counter's value after that last iteration? We just pushed back 9 right here, and we added 1. 9 plus 1 is? I know it's early, 10. So counter's value is 10, so that's good. Next iteration of the outer loop says put back an empty vector again. And then we're going to push back what value next? 10. So the first row is going to have 0 through 9. Then the next row is going to have 10, 11, 12, up to 19. Then the third row is going to have? 20 to 29, then 30 to 39, etc., cetera, up, th up to 90 through 99. So I'm just going to make some quick dirty code right here to actually print out the results to see that we really are doing the right thing. 
val. So this is all this is right here is just printing out the vector, nothing special. So if we run this, we get exactly what we, uh, what we just determined the result to be. Okay, um, any, yeah, go ahead. Uh, have counter B what? Oh, so like, uh, so like int counter is what though? Yeah, so, so this, it initializes it to zero every time in the for loop. So in fact, if we run it like this, what should we expect? Just zeros everywhere. And in fact, that's what we get. So the reason I had it out at the very end, and in fact, if we look at this example, this uh, line right here actually becomes grayed out because if we hover over it, the value is never actually used because it's just reset every time. Yeah. So you can do something like this. Um, another way that you could try to do this is out here, I can just say, let's just say p is 7 as an example. So this outer one tells us how many rows are going to be there. But it doesn't tell us how many uh, of the inner vectors, how long each of the inner vectors is, which is, for the lab's case, we want to have seven elements in each of those. So what would we do in that case? So what we would do is, uh, let's look at each of the uh, rows in this vector. And note, I'm using a reference here because I want to modify the original row to populate it with the table values from the lab. So row is itself a vector event. So here I'm going to define, um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to make a vector, uh, oh, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. So I want to make sure that row has exactly p elements. I could just say push back some value p times, that's fine, but what I'm going to do instead is row.reserve p elements. So what this does is it automatically makes the size of the vector exactly p elements. Okay, So instead of having to do pushback, pushback, pushback many times, this will do it all in one swoop. And then what we can do here is for uh, auto val in, uh, in row this time, oops, then we can do uh, this counter business again. So maybe we can make a counter equal to zero. And then val, since it's a reference now, I'm, by setting it equal to something, I am changing the original value in the vector. Okay? So that's why I put a reference here, to make it easier. But I could have easily just done this with indices as well, and then looked up that corresponding index. That will work exactly the same. So maybe we can do uh, val equal to counter, and same thing like before. So then if we run this, um, hmm. okay, that was not supposed to happen. Hmm. Okay, hmm. that's weird. So, so let's see. Let's try to reason through it. So for every row in the vector, we're reserv reserving p elements. Um, okay, hmm. let's try indices. Uh, idx plus plus, and then row of idx is equal to counter. Although that shouldn't make a difference, yeah, and it doesn't. Maybe it's something to do with this reserve. Maybe let's try doing a pushback and see what actually happens. So here, what we would want to do instead is to um, here we're going to do an actual pushback. So row dot pushback of uh, counter in this case. Yeah, C++ has a lot of gotchas sometimes. Yeah. 
I'll try to look up and see why that actually occurs, but reserve should make the vector that particular size. I'm not sure why it doesn't here. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. But if you do pushback, um, that will always work here. Yeah. Yeah, I would have, uh, I would have had a seg fault. But uh, yeah, I don't know why that actually occurred. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the value isn't really important here. So th this would just make uh, identical columns. Uh, th that wouldn't actually do anything here. But uh, this IDX belongs to this uh, second for loop, but the counter keeps changing no matter what happens. Yeah. So uh, it would just give you a different result, but it still can be populated in a different way. So then what you would do here for the lab, for example, is instead of IDX here, actually do the calculation uh, in the integers mod p, and then push back that value, and then you're all set. Yeah. Right. So, uh, great question. So here we have a range-based for loop, right? So this range-based for loop is, I got to specify the type of the thing, reference maybe or not, then the name of the variable I'm making with the colon and the container I'm looping over, array or vector. So here, I could have easily just equally well said vector of int here, but if I were to change this type to like long, for example, then I would have to change it here. So by making uh, auto here, I only have to change it in one place. Yeah, yeah, you can do that too. Yeah, so you can push back a whole vector if you want to. There are, of course, multiple approaches you can take here. So right at the beginning, I just say how many rows there are going to be. And then here, uh, the second for loop takes care of uh, adding columns to each individual row. Other questions? OK. So uh, let's get back into uh, search and sort. So we last time talked about linear and binary search. Is binary search always faster than linear search? No. And in particular, what cases is linear search, as we have demonstrated, faster than binary search? For, for tiny vectors, yeah. For very big vectors, which one wins? Binary search, because uh, for reasons that I hope we'll get to, uh, it, linear search can't take advantage in those cases. But uh, binary search uh, is basically just cut the list in half, assume the list is sorted, and then pick which of the two sides you want to go to based off of the value that you see and the value that you're searching for. Okay, but if we want to actually use this great power of binary search, what do we have to assume about the list? Sorted. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Great question. So I'm not taking the, um, into account the amount of time it takes to sort the vector. But you can think of it, so it depends on the use case. If you're um, only going to have this vector in existence and never change it, and so therefore you only have to take a one-time cost of sorting, then I think it's better here. So it depends on the use case. If you need to sort all the time, then maybe linear search might be better because the fastest sort algorithm is slower than doing linear search. So it depends on the use case. So that's why, like this example that I did last time about actually testing how long this takes, actually test it for your application about which one do we need to sort more often or should I just use a linear search for this? So it really depends on the use case. But other questions? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so um, the only advantage, so the, the advantage, so search algorithms in general are just finding things in a big chunk of data, right? That's, that's all their purpose is. I have some value I want to search, and uh, I have this list of data. I want to determine whether this value is in this list or not, okay? So like, for example, um, if I'm trying to hire a TA for this, this course or a grader or whatever, then what I have to do is a, a, a prospective grader comes to me and gives me his or her ASU ID. Then what I have to do is take that ID and then search it through the list of all ASU employees or students for that matter. Then that search algorithm has to be able to determine is this ID really uh, a person who belongs at this university or not. So uh, then I would have to, that's how the search algorithm would have to work. So linear search is just brute force, go through the entire list, assume nothing about the list itself. It could be not sorted or sorted, does not matter. Because all we're doing is just searching through the list and eventually if we find it, is obviously in the list. Does that make sense? The, so what is the advantage of binary search? Why would I use binary search over, say, linear search? Oh, sorry? Yeah, so for a very large number of people like ASU with 100,000 students, uh, on average, if I'm doing linear search, on average, I'm going to do 50,000 comparisons, of course, on average. Maybe I, have to, I might have to go through the entire list, maybe only a few students, but on average, I have to do half the list. Whereas with binary search, if the list is sorted of the ASU IDs, then what we can do is jump to the middle, figure out whether or not the value we're searching for is either in the first half or the second half, because if it's sorted, and we can think, can we, we can determine it's in the first half, I don't have to check the second half. So I'm cutting the list in half every one lookup in this array I'm, I'm doing here. So um, another example will be if I am trying to uh, assign grades, then uh, in the grade center, your names are sort, your scores are sorted by your last name alphabetically. So if I want to find someone with the last name of M, should I check the A's, then the B's, then the C's, then the D's? Does that make sense? Does that make sense for me to do? It's like go through the A, B, C, D to find someone with the last name of M? No. So the whole purpose of binary search is to make me immediately jump to the middle of the list and then look there. And then partition the list into two pieces, figure out which piece I need to be looking in. Okay, so if we actually go back to, uh, let's see. So I have a code example from the chapter. I'll upload these. I think I already did, but this is the one I actually uploaded. So suppose, uh, as another example, we have a list of ID numbers. You could think of these as the 10-digit ASU ID if you want to, but just some ID numbers. Uh, is this list sorted? Yeah, it looks like that to me. It, ones, then twos, threes, yeah, so it is sorted. So should I use linear or binary search for this? Binary search, could I use linear search? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with using linear search here. It doesn't violate anything that linear search is required to do. If I change these two elements in order, like this, can I use binary search now? No. For some values, it will work, but for some other values, it won't work, okay? So, but could I use linear search on this list? Yeah, I can use linear search on any list, but binary search, I can use on sorted lists. So if we instead do put it back in sorted order, then we can use, uh, call the binary search function, which is down here, and there's a binary search function in the library also, which I recommend you use. But we can use this one if we want to. Uh, we jump to the middle element. If we found it, great. If not, then we figure out, OK, uh, where should I move my search to be? Should it be in the first half or second half? 
and we keep going until a termination condition, which is we've determined that the item cannot possibly be in the list. Okay, But the application of this is I have a bunch of items, like uh, ASU IDs or IDs in general. Uh, can I actually determine efficiently whether or not something I'm searching for really is in this list? Because then I can make some decisions. If this item is in the list, then maybe I can look it up and then observe some other attributes of it. If it's not in the list, then I can conclude something from there. Maybe they gave me garbage data. Yeah. Uh, I kind of explained it last time, but the, so quickly I'll go over it. You have two pointers, which is the search range. I'm searching from here to here. Then I go to the middle element, then I figure out whether it's in this half or this half. Okay? And then uh, one of the two must hold, so therefore I continue my search maybe in the first half with these two, jump to the middle element of those of this search range, and then keep going until I've determined there are no elements to search anymore. Other questions? Okay, so we, oops, we're not to that yet. So if we want to use all this nice power of binary search, we have to make the lists what? Sorted. So maybe we can figure out, okay, can we actually sort the data? If we have some unsorted data, can we actually sort it? Well, we saw that there always is an algorithm to sort because my stupid algorithm that I out, uh, uh, outlined last time, which is arrange them in every order, one of them must be sorted. Uh, that's a slow algorithm, but it works. There is a search algorithm here, uh, I mean a sorting algorithm here. But we can in fact do better. So the one we uh, introduced last time was bubble sort, which is we have um, elements that we want to, if they're light elements, so they have small value, then they're going to float to the top. And if they have heavy value, they're, they have large value, they're going to float, or I guess sink, to the bottom. So we went over this example last time, which is 17 and 23, are they in the right order? 17 and 23 only. Yeah, they're in the right order, so I don't do anything with them because they're in the right order. 23 and 5, are they in the right order? No. So then I do a swap to make them be in order. Then I iterate, keep going through. 23 and 11 now, they are in the wrong order, so I swap them. Because I made a swap already, I need to jump back to the beginning and then scan through again. And then if I make a change again, i got to scan through again, scan again, until at some point I'm not going to make any changes along the way. But if I make no changes along the way, what can you see about the list now? It must be sorted. So uh, therefore, in this example, we get uh, a sorted list. By the way, um, uh, this example shows that it works on this um, uh, this list, it could sort this list. Does that mean it'll always work on every list by showing this example? Does an example prove a statement? No. So, but think about how it actually works. Um, think about what happens. If I have things in the wrong order, then what's going to happen is the lighter element is going to go forward toward the beginning of the list. Okay? And at every single point, uh, I must make a change because if I don't, then the list is sorted anyway. So therefore, the smaller elements are going to go toward the beginning and the big elements are going to go toward the end. Because, and then therefore, we can't get into a situation where we'll just keep flipping two values over and over and over. And so this must uh, stop and work on every single list. And the great thing is that it's easy to implement. All right, so let's go back here in the show. Uh, I have a code example here. Uh, I think this is, yeah, this is bubble sort. So uh, I'll upload this too. So here's a uh, integer array. You can use a vector if you want. So there's this function down below. It, it's not really important. That just prints the array to make it easier for us. 
then we're going to call this sort array function, and then we'll call show array again. So let's actually let's actually run it. So I'm going to copy and paste it into uh, C line, and then let's just see what happens. So it has the unsorted values, which is the original list, which is good, and then the sorted values, which are in the right order, which is nice. So let's see uh, the implementation of it. So the key is here, if we have to swap two elements, then we got to figure out how do we swap the elements, okay? But the, the rest of it is easy to understand. So bool swap right here, so uh, this will indicate in each pass whether or not we have actually made a swap. If, it, uh, if we have not made a swap, then this swap equals true statement will never be executed. And then because swap is false and was never changed, we'll exit this do while loop. Okay? We must go through the loop at least one time, uh, but you can actually change this to just a while loop, but they use do while here. Okay, so what actually happens here? So think about it this way. So we have to observe uh, some element and the element right after it, okay, in order for binary search to work. Uh, is this even going? Yeah. Okay, so you have to look at some element and the next element right after it. So what is the highest index of the first element uh, of the array? If the array has 10 elements in it, what is the index of the first element going to be? Well, well, initially zero, but the very last time, what is the highest index of the first element going to be? Well, the number of elements minus one is the very last element, but this, the first index, has to be one before it. So in this case, it has to be what? It has to be eight, not nine. Because I have to look at some value and the one right after it. Okay? So that's why I have less, strictly less than here, size minus one. So if I wanted to go all the way to the very end, I would put less than size. But here I have less than size minus one because I have to make room for the second pointer. Okay, so let's see. Uh, actually, let's do this. So I'm gonna do. A, I'm gonna call uh, the show array function with the passed in array and size here, so that we can actually see what actually happened all the way through. Okay, so let's see what happens. Um, so what happened is. 7 and 2, so let's actually make a text document. Oops. Research stuff. All right, so here's our uh, list so far. I'll make it bigger. Okay, so first pass. Should I swap 7 and 2? Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, this second row is going to be our workspace, so where we're going to actually do the change. I'm going to keep the rest of the array the same for now. But let's just make that change. Should I swap 7 and 3? Are they in the right order? No, so I have to make a swap. Should I swap 7 and 8? No, they're in the right order. 8 and 9? No. Uh, 9 and 1? Yes. So in fact, we get this second row right here, which is good. So now let's do another pass. Uh, so, first off, did we make a change along the way? Yeah, pretty obviously. So, we have to go through again. Should I swap 2 and 3? No. 3, 7, no. 7, 8, no. 8 and 1? Yes. Dramatic pause. Um, should I swap 8 and 9 now? No. So, did we make a change along the way? Yes. So, uh... No, we're not going to change. No, we're not going to change. Seven and one, I think we're going to change. Make another pass because we made a change along the way. Uh, it's pretty obvious we're going to change the three and one now. We made a change, so let's do another pass. We're going to swap the one and two. We made a uh, uh, we made a change, so we have to go through again. 
How come the array is printed again right here? Yeah, I have to go through one more time because I, I, there may be some switch that I need to make at some later point that I haven't taken into account yet. So I will print the array one more time here, even though it already is sorted. Okay? But so then we'll, oops, so then we'll get this, and then that'll be the end because did we make a change along the way of this iteration? No, because one is less than two, less than three, less than seven, less than eight, less than nine. The whole array is sorted. Sweet. So that's good. So we're just going to keep going through this entire, entire algorithm while we've made a swap. So let's see. So we're going to observe some index of the array, this count variable. Probably not the best name for a variable, but there's some index right here. And then if this index, the first one, is bigger than the next one, so if this index is bigger than this index, should we perform a swap? The earlier index is larger than the second index, the higher index. Yeah, we should make a swap here. So how do we do a swap? So I'm going to comment this code out for a second. And I want you to tell me, tell me whether this works. So I'm going to set array of count to be uh, the value in array of count plus one. And then, so I'm moving this value to the first index. And then now i got to move the value from the first index to the second index. So then array of count plus one is equal to array of count. And so that should do a swap. Well, let's run it. Ooh. Hmm. What happened? Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. I'm doing a bad thing here. So uh, I'm taking the thing in the second index, moving it into the first index. But wait, they have the same value now. Hmm. That kind of sucks. So I have things in the same that have the same value, even though I just determined this value has higher value than the second index. So what is a better idea? Yeah. So let's make a temporary variable to hold one of the two values. So we're going to make a temporary variable to hold this value temporarily. But I will still move this value over. So I'm going to move the second value over to the first. So they do have the same value, but this temporary variable has the old value of the first index. Yeah. Yeah. So you could um, uh, do this by reference, but the issue is uh, where are you going to save the value? Right? So if you're going to move some value over here, you can't do a simultaneous switch here. Uh, so there's actually a very, very nice function in the standard library that I highly recommend you do called standard swap. Uh, yeah. So then swap here will actually do the reference, as you, as you mentioned, um, for you. So it basically just d does these next three lines automatically for you. So this will do exactly what we want, I hope. Yeah. So I recommend you use standard swap. But if you happen to not like standard swap for whatever reason, uh, I don't know, I guess you don't like swap, uh, then you save the original value of one of the two. It doesn't matter which one, but in this case, they pick this one. We save it out, uh, move the other value into this count index, and then put into the other index, the second one, the original value of the first. So I'm swapping the two values by temporarily moving this value over here, putting this value into the first, and putting the old value back into the second. So I really am swapping the two. Okay? Any questions on how swap works? So just be careful in that if you try to swap 
with two indices and you don't use a temporary, you could be overwriting some value that was already there. So just be careful of that. But in a nutshell, that's how binary search works. Uh, not binary, binary search, uh, uh, bubble sort. So all we're doing is we're just going to keep going as long as we have swapped at some point through uh, some iteration, we're going to keep going. Well, if this if statement is never true on some pass, then what must it be? It must be that array of count is less than or equal to, oops, less than or equal to the next index. So this value is less than or equal to this one. But if that's true the whole way through, what can I say of the array? It must be sorted. Because this value is less than or equal to this one, which is less than or equal to this one, less than or equal to this one, all the way through. So if there is at any point where this is not true, then we will perform a swap, and then at some point later, iterate through the list again. Okay? Any questions on how bubble sort works? Okay. So uh, that's bubble sort. So it's actually relatively easy to implement. So uh, all we need is this outer loop and then an inner loop to make one pass at a time, pretty much. Maybe some bool value or, and some conditions and swapping, but the whole idea is that we're making passes as long as we've made a swap at some point. Okay, so the disadvantage here is um, if we have a really small value right here, so like if I'm trying to swap some really small value here and a very big value here, it may be the case that this value right here is going to have to go all the way to the beginning of the list. And this, this bigger one is going to have to go to the end of the list. But in bubble sort, they only move one position. And if they have to go a really long distance, then I'm going to be making a lot of swaps along the way through, even if this is the only swap I make all the way through. So bubble sort in that regard is not efficient for very large lists. Could it be efficient for small lists? Yes. So efficient here means uh, how long uh, an actual implementation takes, not as a list gets bigger, how long it takes. OK, so let's talk about a faster sort. So this one is called selection sort. There are many, many, many other sorting algorithms, not just these two. But these are a representative sample of some easy to understand and implement uh, sorting algorithms. So here's, here's what happens. So I'm looking at some, uh, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the smallest element in the array, wherever it is. Maybe it's right here. And then I'm going to look uh, at the position 0. So this element right here, where does it go at the very end? Once sorting is done, this is the smallest element. Where does it go? Index 0. Because it's the smallest element. Okay, so this element will be at the beginning of the list. So whatever is at the beginning of the list, should it be at the beginning of the list? No, so like if we, uh, let's look at this example. So if we go back here, what is the smallest element in this array of six numbers? One, uh, should seven be at the beginning of the list? No, because 1 is not at the beginning of the list. So I will do a swap of 1 and 7. So I will, let's just do it in place. I'll do a swap like this. Then 1 is in the right place now. So what should I look at next? Index 1. And then I carry through all the way through until the list is sorted. So uh, any last minute questions? Yeah. No, no sorting on the test. Yep. All right, I'll see you at the test.